Jehovah reckoned Abel's faith to him as righteousness by making a covenant with him, by taking Abram into covenant fellowship with himself. What, what a, when he says he imputed righteousness because Abram believed, as I said before, he imputed his life. Mm-hmm. He gave his life in covenant. You give me your daily life, I give you mine. Mm-hmm. And that you have given me yours is indicated by the slaying of these animals. You're, you're identified with them. On that day, he made a covenant. Abraham's faith was Abraham's act. Faith was an act. It's not just a mental ascent. It's an obedience. And the killing of the animals indicates an obedience unto death. This is cat smell speaking, not the image. If faith is not a faith unto death, is it really a faith? Now, what does that mean? A faith unto death. Could you give me a synonym? When you say a faith unto death. If it's not a faith unto death, it's not faith. It's a faith unto final end. Okay. It's a faith that goes all the way. It's all the way. It has no thought for itself, no regard for the consequence, what it may be. Our benefit or our loss, it's all the way, it's unto death. Mm-hmm. Or it's not faith. If there's any hedging, any reservation, any conditional holding back, any partialness, instead of totality, it is not Abrahamic faith. But when God said that faith, he made a covenant with him in that day. Mm-hmm. If Abraham had said, well, I'll give him this animal, but I won't give him that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll give this portion, but I won't give that. There would not have been covenant. There's a requirement for totality. Because God gives himself in totality. Because that's his nature. And so he brought Abram into covenant fellowship with himself. Wow. Yeah. What greater gift. What, how giving God is. The givingness of himself to a man. Because I am thy great reward. I'm your shield. That's why you don't you, don't be afraid. You have me. Not just my support or when you're in a crisis clutch situation. From this covenant time on, I am with you, in you. I am your very life, your support, your sustenance, your all. Walk thou before me and be thou perfect. I am the Lord God Almighty. He says to Abraham in another place, I'm giving my life. I'm giving you all. Why should you be afraid? I'm your security, your wisdom, your courage. Because you give your all. Okay. Remember when uh, Jacob slept on a rock? When the sun came down on Jacob, the sun set on Jacob. Isn't it remarkable? Every pivotal key episode in the patriarchal history of the nation of Israel somehow takes place in darkness. When the sun was set on Jacob is more than just uh, the sun going down. The sun means anything in which Jacob had hoped has been demolished. He's a fugitive. He's in flight. He's in fear for his very life. The sun has set on every Jacob aspect of his life. Mm. Then God appears to him in a dream. And he sees the ladder set up to the heavens. Remember that? Mm. And he says, how dreadful is this place. Mm. You know when we say awful? You see, we have lost the meaning of words. Mm. Mm. Dread and awe is the very sense of the otherness of God. And we have lost that sense. There is no fear of God in the church. Uh But when he comes in wrath, men will hide themselves in the cleft of rocks and say to the mountains, fall on us, to flee from the face of him who comes. The fear of God will smite men who are today blasphemous, who use the name of Jesus as a curse without thinking twice. Then, great fear. It is for us to nurture, cultivate, and hold this sense of God, the sense of His dread. So that don't be afraid is not don't be afraid of me. 
Don't make me a commonplace. I'm not your buddy. There's a respect. I'm something other. And yet, I'm joining with you. And I'll be your defense. So we need not to confuse these, these kinds of fear. There is darkness, clouds, judgment, wrath, fire. Is the setting of Israel's final history. Its last episode in earth before it comes into the same union that Abraham did. Uh, is Israel presently in this covenant relation? Uh, uh, it has forfeited his, his, their covenant. But he makes with them a new covenant. And that brings up the question, why in, if this text is symbolic of Israel's final coming into this through clouds and darkness and wrath and fire, how is it that Abraham slept through it in his vision? Mm. After driving away mm -hmm. these devouring birds, mm. it says, and Abraham slept. Mm. Where does it say that? Mm. Mm. Verse 12. Mm. Oh. A deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And it came about when the sun had set, in verse 17, that it was very dark. This is that same time. Mm -hmm. And behold, there appeared a smoking of a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Because his sleep incapacitated him from being an actual participant. Because when the covenant is made, the two who make the covenant pass through the pieces. In this covenant, it is only the flaming torch and the smoking pot, symbolic of God and his glory, alone. Abraham is sleeping mm -hmm. and out of the picture altogether as participant. Because this is a vision given by God, it's every detail is divinely ordered. So if God in the detail sees that Abraham, a deep sleep comes over him, is not falling, taking a nap. Mm -hmm. This is something that's come from God to keep him out from being participant. And my question is, why? And then, and then Jim rightly says, hey, that's just like Israel. In a certain sense, they will be out of it also. If something will happen to them and for them, but independent of them. And that even when their repentance comes, it is, comes as a gift. When the Lord comes in Zechariah 12 to save Israel out of its final extremity, when two-thirds of Jerusalem has already been uh, lost, and one third has yet to pass through the fire. Uh, it says, uh, upon the city of David and on Jerusalem comes the spirit of supplication and of prayer. And they shall see him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for one one's, one's only son and be in bitterness as one is in bitterness for one's firstborn. It's actually grace and supplication. Grace and, grace and supplication is what's. Do you know how I read that? God does not allow Israel in any way out of his own religiosity, his own ethicality to exhibit itself. It is pure grace. It is pure gift. Even the ability to mourn and repent is given. Like for a gift of the spirit of supplication. And the repentance is a gift of God. Isn't that what the scripture tells us? Yeah. Yeah. It's the goodness of God that leadeth men unto repentance. Yeah. Because God is God, and no flesh will share his glory. Yeah. That's why Paul ends the great drama of Israel and the church in Romans 9 to 11. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. He could have said, to whom alone be glory forever. Because if it's not alone his glory, it's not his glory. Mm. We don't know God as we ought. Mm. And that's why we touch his glory and seek to find a place in it and mix our own motives with his work and make it impure and unpriestly. Mm. He will not be uh, owing to any man or to any nation. Israel is a witness nation of man in, the, in its yeah. finest ability. And God will not allow it to succeed on that basis at all. He didn't allow Abraham to succeed on that basis. When Abraham was 90 years old and nine, when he looked upon his body as being dead and, and was beyond all human hope, Abraham believed in God. 
is a rem- uh, Jesus would not trust himself to any man, for he knew what was in man. Mm. Although they, they said that he must be Messiah, because they saw the miraculous things that he did, but he would not allow himself to be known by them or to be received of them on the basis of what they saw with their natural eyes. For he would not entrust himself to man. And even his cousin, John the Baptist, who grew up with him and must have recognized the exceptional quality of this relative, did not introduce him to Israel as the Messiah in the waters of Jordan on the basis of his natural knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But when the dove came down and abode on him, that was the revelation that this is the chosen one, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. It was not John's natural knowledge that was the basis for communicating to Israel who this one is. It was the confirmation of the dove from heaven the, and the voice of the Father, this is my Son, mm-hmm. in whom I am well pleased. Mm-hmm. How We need to have that so etched in our hearts God will not be beholden to any man. Mm. He will not trust in any man's flesh. Abraham had to sleep, for this is God's covenant. Mm-hmm. And Israel will sleep and receive, it, uh, receive an everlasting covenant. I will make a new covenant with you. Not the covenant of the kind that I made with your fathers, which they broke, though I was a husband unto them. And this shall be my covenant. I will write it in your hearts mm. and in your spirits, and I will be in you to fulfill it. It will no more be men telling one another about God. You shall all know me, not by virtue of your Talmudic expertise, but by the impartation of myself in your heart and in your spirit. That's what makes this new. And it's not only new, it's everlasting. You know why? You'll never fail. You'll never break it. You broke all the other ones. You have demonstrated your religious incapacity to fulfill covenant. But now I'll make an enduring and everlasting one. You'll never break it because you don't keep it. I keep it. I who have made it, keep it. You sleep. This is fellowship. God offers himself in fellowship to Abram. He gives himself. Because Abram was obedient. What was Abram's faith that made him righteous? He cut up the sacrifice. He laid it open. He parted the parts. That there's, it's an irretrievable giving. You know that word? Mm-hmm. Something that cannot be taken back again. Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, and all the king's men could not put him together again. <laughs> You're not going to take back. You're not going to bring this back. Once you committed this covenant, that's it. How'd you like that for marriage? And if you don't like it for marriage, how then do you like it for God? Yeah. Uh-huh. This is the basis of marriage. Irretrievable. No taking back, once and for all, unto death. And when you do it with that readiness of mind, the covenant-keeping God is there Mm. to supply the life that makes that union possible Mm. as against every stupefying, shrieking difficulty and impossibility Mm. of how can it work a Jew with a Gentile, a Brooklyn a uh, university intellectual with a simple girl who had to make signs to communicate in, in the first time of coming together with Inga. And you're in union, and something has to come from that, and that's got to be enduring against every futility and hopelessness, defeat, and despair. Mm-hmm. Yes, God is in covenant. Amen. And as we said the other day, the fact that divorce is as rife in the church mm. as it is in the world mm. is the statement of how much the church has lost its mm. sense of covenant. That's right. And the God of covenant is the God who creates it and the God who keeps it and the God who fulfills it. And if you don't know God as the covenant making and the covenant keeping, do you really know Him? Mm-hmm. And maybe that's why we've got to go through the fire. That's why we have to pass through the smoke. Mm-hmm. Because it's got to burn up, among other things, an inadequate concept of God that was convenient for us, but was not Him. And that not that exactly Israel's condition? Even its religious condition, let alone its secular condition? They simply do not know as they love to know. And you cannot know except through the fire.
So what is this faith that God honored by coming into covenant fellowship with Abram himself, giving himself? It's to trust, to believe. He gives the Hebrew words here, Oman from Ha'amin, which means to trust as well as to believe it expresses that state of mind which is sure of its object and relies firmly upon it as denoting conduct toward God as a firm inward personal self-surrendering reliance upon a personal being this is the most beautiful definition of faith that I have ever read because she's a scholar who has the advantage of the Hebrew language and burrows into the root of the Hebrew words to give us a dimension of its meaning beyond what we have allowed, quote, faith to become in our time, which is creedal faith, where you subscribe to the correctness of doctrine. Yes, I believe that Jesus was written today. Yeah, I believe he was born of a burden. Hmm? Uh, he was believing and believing. Uh, yeah. What is the, the kind of believing that God honors by giving himself in communion and in union? In covenant, which, by the way, is renewed every time you take the cup of covenant. Mm. The Lord's Supper is a renewing mm. of this compact of agreement. And we're eating and drinking the Lord afresh. But we're drawing again, we're, we're showing again, we're cast upon his life. Because the journey is too great for us. Mm. Eat and drink, the angel said to Elijah a second time. And what have we done with that sacrament? We've made it a religious plastic cup yeah. and a little waffle. Yeah. We take it all together when we're not together. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why the scripture says, contend for the faith once and for all given the saints. We've got to fight for the saints. We've got to fight for a true meaning of faith in an age in which it is deprecated and made something other than what God understood with Abraham. Mm-hmm. But that's what we're doing here. We're not just reviewing something, we're fighting for something. Mm-hmm. And that's why the birds are coming down wanting to devour us. Mm-hmm. Giving me a blind eye and, and fear and everything breaking loose and then you're losing the thing. And, and, and isn't the Lord showing, if my hand were not upon you, oh, and if my yeah. right shadow were not with you, yeah. you guys would be devastated and bowled over. <laughs> this yeah. building would be in flames, there'd be bulldozers <laughs> pushing it in. What, what they did in Waco, Texas, they would do with you. That's right. Yeah. The fact that they haven't is yeah. that my hand of restraint is upon you and you're not in the arrogant spirit of those men who defied the public authorities and ended in, in the way that they did. Mm. As your faith is, so be it unto you. And, mm. and your faith is the meaning that you understand in coming to the communion table. Mm. And that you're not only in communion with God in authenticity, in the sacrificial giving up of yourself, as you have come in union with your spouse in giving up your, your uh, singleness, mm-hmm. but also with the church. Mm-hmm. You're giving your life up also to others in the church. Mm-hmm. You would enjoy your privacy, but the demands of the body require your participation. Mm-hmm. And you give yourself in communion. And if it's not in truth with those with whom we're joined horizontally, how is it true with him vertically? And I, as some of you have heard me say that when the gospel came to Scotland through this Irish missionary, Colombo, mm. that before they came to the Scottish mainland, they lived on an island off the coast of Scotland from Ireland for two years. And then after that, the Lord released them to come before the stronghold of the Picts, P-I-C-P-S, this ancient pagan people who were notorious for bloodshed and violence. And they had a double walled fortress. And Colombo, according to church legend, stood before that impenetrable fortress, and they were just weak men themselves, and he made the sign of the cross. Mm. And when he made the sign of the cross, the gate opened of itself. And when the king saw this, he fell on his face, and he had his entire nation subscribe to Colombo's God. And that's how the gospel came to Scotland, of which we have a piece sitting at this table. Mm. Now, my question is, how come the gate opened? How come the form- every formidable opposition to the truth of God had to open because a man made 
a gesture <laughs> because it was not an empty gesture <laughs> or a vain gesture or a mere religious gesticulation. <laughs> it was a truth, a statement of truth that is both vertical and horizontal, that they were in union with God and with each other. That's why they had two years on the island together, <laughs> establishing the truth of their reality as church. And that that truth opened the gate against which no man can stand. What has God said about the church? Uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. That's if you are the church. Mm-hmm. The covenant honoring and covenant keeping church. If you're just church in name, if you're just institutional, ceremonial, uh, something else, mm-hmm. nothing will, will be moved. So this covenant, I I can't say enough for it. What this means and the depth of it and how its first expression requires all of these symbolic elements. The animals cut in half. Not just uh, something given in part. In totality. Full. The full measure. Nothing was held. And God honors it by his own glory passing through while the co-covenant party sleeps. Not in indifference or boredom or tiredness, but in the sleep that God puts upon him to show, mm-hmm. I exclusively have given this covenant, mm-hmm. you didn't call for it, and I exclusively will keep it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why it's at the last thing. But it requires an inward, personal, self-surrendering reliance upon a personal being, especially upon the source of all being because it is sure of its object and relies firmly upon it in an inward personal self-surrendering reliance unto death yea though he slay me yet will I trust him it is unconditional trust in the Lord and his word even where the natural course of events furnishes no ground for hope or expectation. This is David's writing. And I penciled in where he says, even, I wrote, especially where the natural course of events furnishes no ground for hope or expectation. Isn't that the picture, in many ways, of the church and the gospel to the Jew? They have all the marbles. They have everything going for them. Uh, they're the man of the year. They have the Bernay Brith plaque on their wall. They've never raised their voices to their wives. They're, they, they are the most exemplary, cultured, and uh, um, ethical, moral people. And here we are, knockabouts. We're struggling to make it through. We see our defects daily. We're nothing. Our iniquity is ever before us. And God calls us to stand before them and bring them the power of the gospel. Everything militates against it. It is, the, it is an ultimate collision of impossibilities. What is faith? Faith believes that the, in the Word of God, especially where the natural course of events furnishes no ground for hope or expectation. Because the Word of God says, this gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Faith acts on the Word of God despite every natural appearance to the contrary. Mm. Faith acts according to His Word, especially where the natural course of events furnishes no ground for hope or expectation. Faith is believing the Word of God in action against every thing that is to the contrary. And by this faith, Abraham was placed in living fellowship with God. And that's why righteousness was accounted to him. For the life of God is the righteousness of God. He didn't receive a virtue, Uh an ethical category. He received the life of God. Uh And the life of God is righteous. And it's the only source of righteousness. That's why God could say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. 
But Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Yeah, you did a lot of things. But you did not do it on, out of my life. You did it out of your own religious energy. Mm-hmm. Out of your own natural ability. And it's unrighteous. It's wicked. You, you're a worker of iniquity. Mm-hmm. The only thing that would have made that work righteous is if its fulfillment had come out of the energy of my life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, sure, it's not what the work is. It's the source by which it is performed. Mm-hmm. And that life is available only in communion by covenant relating people who trust God totally. And what do we make then of uh, these animals? One of every species of the animal suitable for sacrifice. And Abraham took these and divided them in the midst and placed one half opposite to the other. Well, we can ask the question, what if Abraham omitted even so much as one of these animals, even the smallest of them, say one of the birds, the, the, the doves? What if he gave everything but one? Would God give him like a high batting average? <laughs> you know, you come up, you hit three out of ten, you're a candidate for the Hall of Fame. <laughs> the beauty of this is, and the point that this is, totality. Mm. The big thing and the small thing. And you cannot, you cannot omit anything. You hold nothing back for yourself. Remember when God gave the commandment to Saul, who was then king through the prophet Samuel, to destroy the Amalekites and to spare not infant, suckling, camel, sheep, ox, and ass? And they did most of that. But they spared Amalek the king of the Amalekites, and the best of the sheep and the oxen to make a sacrifice unto the Lord. And it says, Samuel wept all the night. Mm-hmm. And what, 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 what does God say to Saul the next day through the prophet? Sacri- uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. And as you did not obey the Lord, I will remove from you your kingdom. Partial obedience is disobedience. You can quote me. Mm-hmm. Partial obedience is disobedience. When God calls for the ox, the ass, the whatever, as well as the birds. He's, maybe the birds are the, the little thing that you would think, well, you can get away with or hold back for yourself, is the final measure of the totality to which you give yourself. So we need to interpret these symbols. Here's what I wrote in the margin about what it means to give of every species of animal suitable for sacrifice. Aaron took these and divided them in the midst. Totally, all that was required, irretrievably, that means cannot be taken back. You're not going to glue these pieces together again. Mm -hmm. Once they are cut Mm -hmm. and separated, Mm -hmm. that's it. You don't take back your singleness, your single status. You don't reserve for yourself your own name. We just received, isn't it interesting, the coincidence of a letter from Europe where, the, the, and we know this, precious family uh, over the years, they are now divorced. Mm-hmm. And uh, instead of changing the address label, um, we sent the, this newsletter with the same address label to Mrs. Da, 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 da. Well, the first da, 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 is her own name, mm-hmm. and the second is the name of her husband. Mm-hmm. And she takes the envelope of the label and puts it into her new envelope and sends it back and crosses out his name. Mm-hmm. And she's making clear that I'm now divorced, I don't want his name. But what needs to be made clear to her, what probably made your divorce inevitable, mm-hmm. was that you mm-hmm. never crossed out your name when you came yes. into covenant with that man Ooh, and yeah. took his name, his identity, mm-hmm. his purpose, mm-hmm. and his being totally mm-hmm. for your own. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. And you, you, there were the seeds of the destruction of that That's marriage right. from the beginning. Right. And she has told me in private conversation, I never gave myself over to my husband. I always had doubt whether this was no. made in heaven. Da, 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 da. I said to her, once it is consummated, Whatever its origin, it's made in heaven. Oh. If you've read Ben Israel, you know how I came together with Inga, not under the most auspicious circumstances. Oh. And I fought against it. And I was trying to make the best of a bad thing, but it wasn't working. 
until I came to a place in my understanding and faith mm -hmm. that whatever the origin, mm -hmm. once it is established mm -hmm. in marriage, it is made in heaven. Mm -hmm. And you have no out. Mm -hmm. You have no out. You can't point back to, well, I don't know, uh, I, I had doubts at that time. Mm -hmm. That's the enemy. Those are the birds coming down That's from right. heaven to devour. And you've got to fight them off. Fight off those thoughts that want to nullify covenant in which God mm -hmm. is part. And will bring it to fulfillment mm -hmm. for His glory, not right. your compatibility. That's right. The issue of marriage is not you're getting along. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's not your compatibility yeah, right. and your enjoyment. It's yeah. His glory. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's an enactment. It's a depiction of the covenant-making God. And if it fails in your marriage, how shall it succeed with Israel? Mm -hmm. That's right. I remember I had a meeting in in Canada, and through separate doors came a German couple whom I've known for years. The wife through ex-wife through one door, and they, they, they had already begun their divorce proceedings, and the husband through another, and they sat in on the message on Israel, and God's last day's restoration, because he's obligated, because of the covenant that I have made with you. Mm. The deliverance shall come out of Zion, when, when um, the fullness of the Gentiles will come in, and so, as it is written, the deliverance shall come out of Zion, and... Um, and I'll take transgression from Jacob according to the covenant that I have made with them. They have, may have failed. They may not have been faithful, but I have made that covenant, and I'm under obligation to fulfill it despite them. That's why Abraham slept. It's not his ability. I who made it will fulfill it. And so I gave an invitation for people who are going to stand with God's purposes for Israel. And she stood in one part of the room, and he stood in the other. And so after the service, I went up to them and said, What do you believe God for his honoring of his covenant to Israel in the last days? He will restore them to himself? How then are you going to a divorce court because you cannot believe it for your own marriage? Where do you think they are today? They never went through with it because they were on the, on the horns of a dilemma that they could stand to believe God for Israel and they could not believe for their own marriage. Right. They saw the, the terrible contradiction mm -hmm. and they had to go along though they thought it was hopeless and they're married to the state and doing well. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. It's because God keeps us in union yeah. mm -hmm. that what we That's think right. is impossible yeah. finally is attended in a way that not only just makes it workable but makes it glorious. Yeah. Yeah. I've not yet come yeah. to that with anger, but I'm believing for that. Mm -hmm. So long as we honor covenant and stay together. I want it because God's honor is at stake. Mm -hmm. And evil makes it we'll keep it. Okay, we've got to move on. These are precious thoughts and considerations. Well, listen to what David says. Written long before the Hitler time. The choice of sacrificial animals for a transaction which was not strictly a sacrifice was founded upon the symbolic significance of the sacrificial animals. That is, upon the fact that they represented and took the place of those who offered them. See, these animals stood for something. It's your death that's being uh, depicted in the death of the animal. In the case before us, they were meant to typify or to be symbolic of the promised seed of Abraham. In other words, something was being transacted with those animals that was suggestive of the seed of Abraham for the generations to come. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That they would pass through the fire, that, that uh, there's a time when all Israel is somehow symbolized already in the sacrifice that, God, that Abraham is putting before God. It's suggestive mm -hmm. of the future of the people of the seed of Abraham himself and their diversity yeah. in, the, in the forms of animals that are represented. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, this is where you just kind of walk out on a plank or a tight wire. You're, you're feeling for something, and I appreciate his thought, which is all the more real to us now than, than it could have been when he wrote yeah. That these animals are descriptive and suggestive of the variety of Abram's descendants. Mm -hmm. the, the, the northern tribes, the southern tribes, the Ashkenazic, the Sephardic, all of the, the secular, the atheistic, the religious, all of the mishmash that makes up Jewry. God's people is represented in the diversity of the animals that are put before God that day. 
And it says in Exodus, when they um, covenanted for this, the Sinai covenant of the Ten Commandments, not only you who are before us this day, but also those who will be your descendants are caught up, I'm paraphrasing, I don't know the exact words, are caught up and are implicated and are involved in this transaction. You're not just transacting for yourself. You're transacting for generations yet on one. Oh. Mm-hmm. Oh. And that's symbolic. And David is saying, in the diversity of the animals, they represent and typify the promise seed of Abraham. But in the case before us, the animals represent represented Abram and his seed, not in the fact that they're being slaughtered as significant as the slaying of that seed, but only in what happens to in connection with the slaughtered animals. Birds of prey attempted to eat them, and when darkness, extreme darkness came on, the glory of God passed through them. All the seed of Abram was concerned, not of every kind of animal suitable for sacrifice was taken. Well, maybe here I would depart from him and say that it is significant of the slaying of that seed. Hmm. That out of the death, uh, that of the remnant, hmm. comes uh, its restoration. The eight animals, the eight parts representing resurrection hmm. and the day of new beginnings or newness of a restored nation. Hmm. Wow. And that's why the birds wanted to eat that up. They don't want the final um, meaning of what was represented here, for it's the end of the birds. It's the end of the false uh, usurping gods of this world. Uh, and so the transaction, here's what I'm saying, is finalized. In God's approval of that sacrifice, he validates it by his own presence. Just as he did in darkness over the crucifixion of Jesus when the great darkness covered the earth. And God brought and received a firstborn son. The birds of prey represented the foes of Israel who would seek to, he writes, eat up, that is, exterminate it. Isn't that remarkable? Uh That long before the Hitler time, he employs this word. Uh Eat up to devour is to exterminate. Uh Uh And the fact that Abram frightened them away was a sign that Abram's faith and his relation to uh, to, uh, to the Lord would preserve the whole of his posterity from destruction. That Israel, and here's the punchline saints, would be saved for Abram's sake. Now you want to hear what I have wow. done with this thought? What does Abram driving the birds away represent? He sleeps through everything else, but God allows him this act, this one act, because if those birds had succeeded, he would not only have invalidated the initial covenant, but all of its meaning for the future descendants of Abraham's seed, which is yet to take place. And it's the faith of Abraham as an act drives them away. Or, let's say, Abrahamic faith to the, another seed of Abraham that preserves the sacrifice and enables its final fulfillment in Israel, namely, the church. Uh, Lord, give me a grace to, to try and, and express this, that there's a seed of Abraham which Paul quite clearly tells us in Galatians is the church who share the faith of Abraham and that their final task is to drive away the birds that would seek to devour this, the other seed of Abraham, which is Israel. Uh-huh. They would be saved for the seed of Abram's sake, or to say, Zion's sake. Uh-huh. Deliverance will come out of Zion, which fits in so well with all that I understand of God's purpose for the church in its last day's posture toward Israel when the birds will come down and seek to exterminate it. The only thing that will preserve a remnant of that people are the seed of Abraham that is the church that will protect, nurture, uh, give refuge, and help to preserve that final restoration that concludes the age and establishes God's restored nation and his kingdom and his glory. Well, are, are you understanding? Yeah. 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 It's going to take Abraham's faith on our part mm-hmm. to drive those birds away. Mm-hmm. This is that Abraham's faith. It drives away the devourers and provides. And it's a very factual and actual fulfillment will take place in the wilderness 
according to Ezekiel 20, I will meet with you in the wilderness of the nations. Revelation 12 of the woman um, who is given wings of an eagle and flies into the wilderness where she is kept or fed for three and a half years. So it's the Abrahamic faith of the seed of Abram, the church, the true church, the remnant church, the wilderness church, the overcoming church, that preserves the sacrifice from being devoured in that final day. That's, that's, all of that is encompassed in this initial vision that was given Abraham. So I just want to read that again. We can end and pray on that thing that takes place when the sun is set, which he says is the departure of grace, which at one time had shone upon Israel, and the commencement of a dark and dreadful period of suffering for Israel's posterity. That's the time of Jacob's trouble, yet future. A time of dark and a, a dreadful period. That if God did not cut the time short, as we heard last night, no flesh, no Jewish flesh would survive. It will exceed every previous tribulation and suffering of Jews, including the previous Holocaust. Even what was described to us in that holiday that you say about they hung the they strangled children around the neck. Yeah, while they crucified women. And that this tribulation will exceed all previous sufferings. Oh. It's, it's a darkness and a dread yeah. that is hard now even to be imagined. And, and we even said on the overseas trip, I, we wondered if there's some symbolic significance in, in um, the wilderness prophet oh. Elijah being fed by a widow woman yeah. with the last of her flour and her oil. Oh. And he says, feed me first. Yeah. And because she did, her oil did not uh, cease, nor did her flour exhaust. That the feeding of the prophet was the very key to the sustenance uh -huh. of a woman who would otherwise have expired. Uh -huh. And that the giving of ourselves to the remnant of Israel in the last day's tribulation, uh -huh. when we cannot bind ourselves and uh -huh. take the mark uh -huh. of the number of the beast, is God's provision for the remnant church in the abundance that he will give because we give That's right. and uh -huh. give to them first before ourselves uh -huh. in the wilderness. Hallelujah. That's faith. That's oh, Abrahamic yeah. faith that believes in its God. Oh. It's a faith unto death. And that Israel will be saved then for Zion's sake in that dark and dreadful period of suffering that is yet future when the sun sets on Jacob that they might become Israel. Mm -hmm. The things in the beginning have a remarkable oh. indication of things also at the end. Oh. So the restoration of Israel in the last days will be also a judgment on those who have opposed Israel, even as those Canaanitish people did, and their descendants to this day opposed them. Oh. But the point for us, now we've got to conclude, yeah. is that uh, there's a remarkable significance in Abram dragging away the birds that were seek to devour. The one act allowed him, and that is indicative or suggestive of a people of the last days who are the seed of Abraham. Not the Jewish seed, but the Gentile seed, the church of, the, uh, of God, the Zion of God, who drive away those that were seek to devour, that people represented in that sacrifice. And also um, provide for them the things that make for their survival and their return. <coughs> Go back over this text. Don't, don't think that it's exhausted. We're only mm. opening and beginning something, but uh, re remarkable what is given in the book of beginnings. Mm. So, Lord, we bless you and love you. God of the covenant, remarkable, when you are willing to give of yourself in totality, even the righteousness of your life to those who give of themselves in totality without taking back. Lord, we bless you. It's only on that basis that it can be for you what we want in these last days. When we look about, my God, uh, we'll be full of discouragement and, the, and overwhelming things. But it will be the covenant-keeping God mm -hmm. whose life will be given to us in fellowship and in union that will enable us to succeed in all that is before us in preserving the remnant of Israel in their last days of darkness and judgment and fire. Mm -hmm. 
Lord, write these things in our hearts and show it to us in other ways. And help us to reveal, my God, the precious new covenant, the everlasting covenant to which we have been brought. And may it be renewed and uh, 